Hey there, South Strong Nation, Joe Simons, and yes, that's a big old bad snook there on top of me. That's a snook, a little wood carving I got there in Costa Rica when Luke and my dad and I went uh, snook fishing in Costa Rica for a couple weeks. Had an amazing time, caught some massive snook as uh, well. But here's the deal, we just recorded snook fishing in the summertime. Everything you need to know about targeting snook in the summer in this podcast. And this is just a little taste of what you're going to get in Captain C.A. Richardson's upcoming snook mastery course. It's going to be coming out very soon. But in the meantime, enjoy the podcast. Pow! Hello, Salt Strong, Fish Strong Nation. We're back, Salt Strong Brothers, for another awesome episode of the Fish Strong Podcast podcast this one's all about snook fishing in particular we're going to really hammer away on snook fishing in the summertime which we are about to enter and luke we just had a really cool priv privilege of filming snook mastery with captain ca richardson i i think you'll agree with me it's one of those fish that they're kind of finicky or a lot of bit finicky and we've had so many people have asked us to put a course together over really the past two years. And this is, it just kind of felt right. CA was like the guy because he's probably caught more snook than anyone we know, uh, especially on artificial lures. And man, it, I can't wait for everyone to see this because it was, I mean, it's, I don't know, 20 plus years of his experience giving away all his best tips and secrets on not just catching them, but catching slot snook over slot snook and catching snook all the time kind of on demand it's going to be awesome yeah snooker they're unique fish that uh, it seems like a lot of people have trouble with them it seems like from the surveys we've done with our with our members it's it's always the one that's like has like the most mystique if you will for some reason but and i was there too so i, I totally relate um as a bass angler transitioning to, to salt water but like now, like once you get it, like they're, they're actually, they're pretty aggressive fish. So once you know, just like the, all the little small things like you know, how to put it all together, they're, they're actually a, a pretty, you know, I would say like, you know, kind of easy fish to, to target, at least the smaller ones, the, the tougher one, the bigger ones are, are very tough, but just go out and catch some snook. As long as you're in a territory with snook, it's really not that difficult. Once you know, like the, all, uh, how to put together the small things. Yep. But before we get into that, a quick little note from our sponsor, the Salt Strong Insider Fishing Club, the only fishing club guaranteed to help you catch more fish or you don't pay. It's literally free if you don't catch more fish, become more consistent, and have more fun. And I'm willing to bet probably the only fishing club that actually reveals their own spots and, and more importantly, talks about and reveals the trends to be able to predict where the snook and the redfish and the trout and the flounder and black drum and tarpon will be all year long because it's it's all about finding the feeding zones and avoiding the dead zones because we all know luke that if it was just about the spots everyone who owned a spot map would just always catch fish which is not the truth so if you really want to become consistent you got to know the trends that's the only way you're going to be able to find the feeding zones all year long no matter where you are to learn, to learn more go to saltstrong.com forward slash podcast that's saltstrong.com forward slash podcast now that the sponsor pitch is out of the way let's talk more about snook fishing so i'll tell you one of the things just right off the bat to give like an awesome tip that i heard ca talk about was the importance of fishing the outgoing tide right luke we were I think probably from watching a lot of those old fishing shows and a lot of the magazines, everyone's like, oh, yeah, just, you know, fish the, the, the incoming tide, the end of the incoming tide. And CA was like, you can catch snook anytime you want. But he's like, don't ignore that outgoing tide. And uh, talk about that real quick. Yeah, yeah. And again, it's just one of those small things that, that is important to, to understand. And snook, they're, they're just they're really a, a very good ambush feeder. And a lot of times they'll they'll take advantage of the outgoing tide where they'll They'll go position themselves in a pothole, you know, or, or, you know, the outside of a flat, you know, or a channel, right? Somewhere where there's a lot of water, you know, that's actually moving uh, bait fish around and, and they'll just sit there and just wait and, and just pounce, you know, pounce on, on uh, any kind of any bait or, or shrimp or crab, any kind of unsuspecting uh, uh, prey that, uh, that, that current, you know, takes to them. So they're very, very current oriented. Um, I, I like, I obviously fish, you know, they can be caught on during any tide cycle, but, um, the easiest time is, uh, is most often the outgoing tide just for that, for that very reason. But the incoming tide can be great too, right? That, that current is still pushing, 
pushing stuff, uh, pushing bait around, pushing prey around. But the outgoing has the advantage because it oftentimes funnels, you know, that bait and that prey into like a narrow channel. And those, those snook will sit there and, and get them. Whereas the incoming tide kind of spreads it, spreads all the bait around. So it's not, not quite as good, but any kind of current movement is good when you're, when you're targeting snook. Yeah, that was another big, you know, takeaway. And, and CA really digs down deep and talks about the importance of current in all the different areas from like the backcountry, like fish in the flats, to the passes, to the docks, what currents are best, like wind directions. I mean, he really, he gives stuff that I've, I've never seen anyone talk about. Uh, really, really awesome. So let's talk about the summertime snook fishing. I know you and I spent a lot of time, you know, growing up fishing in Marco Island where we'd fish those passes and some of the beaches. Um, and then also, you know, little Gasparilla Island and Boca Grande area. So I'm, I'm guessing when you think summertime snook fishing for us, a lot of times it's getting out of the boat or off the boat and just fishing a, a beach or a pass, right? Yeah, that's a good time. Summertime is a, is an awesome time to get those big snook. They're, uh, they're spawning, you know, inlets and passes. There'd be a lot of big snook, uh, in those passes and, it, and it's, it's a great time to get them and, you know, it's obviously tide dependent. And a lot of times it's the end of the outgoing tide seems to be a little bit, uh, you know, at least the, the tide that I prefer, but, um, but again, they're, they're, they're not going to totally go away. They're going to be there. Uh, but yeah, it's all about, you know, getting out there and, and, uh, getting, getting down close to them in many cases when they're in the passes, a lot of times it's going to be, you know, 10 to sometimes 20 feet deep and, and you have to get your lure down there. They're, they're typically going to be toward the bottom. Um, but up in the, sh- up in the flats or on the beaches, you know, they'll hit top water lures. They, they are an aggressive fish when they're, when they're in the mood to eat. Yeah. It's fun when you find them like that. And remember when we were filming, uh, fishing in our soul, yeah. yeah, we kind of finished for the day and we had an hour before the sunset and I believe it was June that we were filming it and we took, you know, the film guys and, you know, they've been busting their butt all day long and uh, a couple of us had fly rods and kind of had a, a, a mixture of everything. And we all caught multiple snook. I mean, I think we caught 25, 30 snook in a really short amount of time. And that's fun. But on the other hand, you know, everyone loves to talk about their success stories. The very next day, the next day, we went to the exact same spot, same lures, and couldn't catch squat. I think we maybe caught one. And so I, I think that's another reason why people are so infatuated with this snook because – uh, that, that is, fr- it's frustrating, right? I, and we, in, in our survey, we, we sent out a survey to our list and asked them their number one challenge when it comes to catching snook. And, and by the way, thank you. If you're one of the, the, the many hundreds or thousands, it was a crazy amount of number of people that, that reply, we're still going through them all. And a lot of people were just like, I hate their attitude. I hate the snook's attitude. It's like catching a cat. I heard someone say that it's just, uh, it's tough. So wh- wh- what are you hear- cat? Yeah, like, know. meaning just... <laughs> I guess they are pretty fast. They yeah. Kind of like reflexes. Finicky, you know, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. Are you cat lovers? Maybe you, I don't know. <laughs> we'll, we'll change the subject before I get any hate mail from uh, from people that have, have cats. I'm personally allergic to cats, so uh, <laughs> that's all I will say. Not a fan. <laughs> so, Luke, when you have days like that where you know they're stuck in the area... You feel like you got, you know, some, some water movement. You, you got a good lure that you've caught snook on before. What, what do you do? Like, what do you do in those situations? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, every day is different, right? Like every day is that. That's why the Insider Club is important because every day is a puzzle and it's all about putting the pieces together as fast as possible. So it's it's all about, you know, knowing what has happened recently. And uh, snook are, are the most affected by by weather changes than, than all the other inshore species. Like, like, especially in the winter time, right? Like they're the first ones to die. If it gets cold, they, they just cannot handle cold weather. So a drop in temperatures will really, really shut them down where they'll, they'll totally react to it. Whereas trout and redfish aren't nearly as affected in most cases. I can't remember the exact details. I can't remember exactly what happened that, that trip, what kind of weather cycle change. Usually it's a, a weather impact. Um, but like just last weekend when we were filming that, that course was CA. We were filming right after a, a pretty sharp cold front came through, a late spring cold front, and and those snook were tough. And and it, it was it wasn't the case that we weren't able to find them. You know, we did actually see a lot of uh, a lot of snook up on the flats. Um, even went out to the beaches. There are already some showing up on the beaches, which is awesome. But they just were not reacting. Even had some like just really good sight fishing chances on them, and they just were not we're not in a feeding stage. They were, they were kind of, you know, that cold water comes, the, the cold air impacts the water, makes it colder. 
and, and they start to kind of go into you know a, a self-preservation mode versus first feeding mode and, but granted they still will strike you just have to just really really get the right lure the right bait in front of them and uh, and make it a you know make it a, a, a easy decision for the for the snook to go out and get a get a quick meal but, but yeah they're tough yeah so i guess a good tip if you do have even just a slight change in temperature that might do what Luke just said, have them go in kind of self-preservation uh, mode, which is what we saw. I mean, so we were seeing them on the flats, and instead of just sitting there and casting till we were blue in the face, we decided just to pick up and leave. And we had we had our chance at some really nice slot, and even some upper slot snook on the flats, and we had a couple nose the lure. I mean, we, it was sight casting at its finest, minus the fact we didn't actually land any. And so we picked up, and we went to we started going to some more water flow where one, they're not going to be as susceptible to hearing us because the snook are uh, pretty finicky. They have lateral lines. They, I mean, they can feel your presence better than much better than redfish in particular. And so we just started hitting up docks where there's a lot of water flow and we're just throwing some, you know, some jigs up there and we caught quite a few snook. And I mean, 30 minutes or so uh, had, I guess, three nice snook. And uh, where a lot of people would have just, you know, kept saying, you know, oh man, we'll stick it out a little bit longer. It was such a, such a good idea. And kudos to you for saying, all right, let's just get up and move. We've got to find a place where water's flowing a little bit more and they're going to be less susceptible to being in that self preservation mode. And it turns and, out it was the docks. And it wasn't, so it wasn't just docks. Uh, so before we were on flats and it was, you know, mostly, you know, let's say one and a half to three feet of water, you know, the potholes were three feet the shallowers were one, but there, there wasn't much deeper than that. And, you know, that, and, it, and we were in, you know, kind of like a protected cove type place. And so when the water's, when the air's cool, cold, right, it, it can impact the water, at least for like a, a couple feet. Um, and so in that situation, that, that water was just cold. So when we moved to docks, we didn't just look for docks by themselves. We looked for docks with current, that had deep water nearby. So a lot of times, whether it's snook, trout, redfish, they all, you know, when a cold front comes in, uh, granted we're talking about summer, uh, we don't really have crazy cold fronts, but when when the cold fronts do come in, they'll typically push the, fit, the fish deeper because that deeper water it just has uh, less, less it, it's, it has less touch to the, uh, to the air. You know, the air can't impact that deeper water as it does the shallows. So those docks where the, where the snook were holding they were very close to deep water. So at night they probably shifted down toward the, toward the deep stuff, but we were catching them, you know, basically in the dock piles, we were skipping lures up under the docks and, uh, and just wrestling those snook out of there. And, and that was 100% the trend because the next day, the day after we, we finished filming, we, we were up in Tampa and, uh, and we went out, it was terrible weather. Um, the, the weather was, uh, the forecast was pretty good and the weather with the wind was ripping, we launched off of Davis Island here in Tampa, so upper Tampa Bay. But whereas before we were, we were way close to the, uh, to the, to the passes and, and the snook were in the exact same type of place where there weren't docks, but there was uh, a shoreline that had, you know, went from about one, one or two feet about, and about five feet off the shoreline dropped down to about three or four feet. And those snook were holding there. So no docks, but it was, it was the depth, you know? Um, so again, they're very finicky fish, but even after the cold fronts, even on the windy, nasty days, they can still be caught. You just have to, you just have to know that the type of, the type of spots to, to go to and whether we were in, you know, St. Pete beach, the, you know, the, the one day, uh, which was one day after the front or two days after the front up in, up in Tampa, the, the same fish were holding the same types of spot. So once you know, you know, once you know that trend, you can, you can get on them regardless of exactly where you are biology and that's yeah. right I mean, that's what it is you, you understand the biology of these fish and a snook is a snook is a snook regardless if it's in you know the upper part of uh tampa bay or right there near the passes of uh of saint pete they and the same thing yeah and when i was when i lived over melbourne beach you know that the, they, they behave the exact same way over there so the fish they're 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 not that smart they seem like they're they're real smart but they're really not they just react to the environment Right, they can't they can't moderate their their body temperatures. They're cold blooded. So, if, if the if the temperature changes real quick and it gets out of their comfort zone, you know they're either going to sit there and uh, and not be active, or they're going to move to an area that that feels better. Yep. And uh, regardless, you need to be in that you need to be fishing in that area that feels better because even if you know 
even if a ton of snook don't move there, the ones that are there are going to be way more likely to strike than those ones that that we were throwing baits at uh, that that first day of filming when we saw them, but they just they just were not feeding. They were not active. Yep. So let's let's go back to focus on the summertime snook. Uh, in particular, let's talk about the beaches because I know you and I both love fishing the beaches, and I'm going to be. I guess I'll be down there in Boca Grande uh, Memorial Weekend. Hopefully, it'll be a little bit warmer than this little front that came through, and and probably doing a lot of the beach fishing. Uh, what what do you like? Rod, reel, line, leader. Yeah, lures. yeah. Beach fishing. That's uh, that's the time for for some fun sight fishing. I love sight fishing snook, and yeah, for beaches, I I, I like to go as light as I can possibly get away with. Um, because you know on the beach there's really no structure so you can you can catch some really big fish on light line when you're fishing the beach and so beach fishing i will pretty much always just have 10 pound braid as the main line and then you know for for targeting snook 25 to 30 pound a leader typically typically can get the job done and again that'll that is it's surprisingly strong it's like a 10 pound braid i'll use power pro and when i was doing the knot contest, right. With, um, with the FG knot, which is the knot that totally shocked me. Uh, but that FG knot with a 10 pound braid to a 30 pound leader was breaking at 22 pounds. And so a lot of people hear 10 pound braid, like, Oh no, that's way too weak. But 22 pounds is a lot of strength. And, and again, if the fish can't, can't wrap you around a piling or anything, it doesn't matter if the line's super thin. And the fact that the line is super thin, you can cast further. Right, I've done I've done casting contests. You can cast over twenty percent further with a ten pound line versus a twenty pound line. Um, well, that's a huge difference. That is such a big that's such a big advantage for the uh, the lighter line. You know, every every foot of extra distance you can you can get is 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 additional strike zone. But it, not only is it additional strike zone, it, it's the best, right? Because those fish have have less and less idea that you're in the in their presence the further and further away. So. I, I always recommend go as light as you can possibly get away with uh, while still handling your target species. Cool. Um, before we talk about lures and what you like to use on the beach, because and I'm still kind of confused on this, so clarify it for me as well. I've been on some beaches with you where we're catching them, uh, you know, in the deeper pockets where actually we, we do need as much line as possible. We're trying to cast out. And then sometimes, I mean, the snook are running – I mean, where you couldn't even have a foot in the water or you don't have a shot to catch them where they're literally just in, you know, six, seven inches of water coming up right next to the shore. So what, when is that happening? Like, wh- and why? Yeah, I mean, a majority of the fish on the beaches are going to be right along the shoreline. And uh, the rare instances when they are out, either there's a bunch of bait out there that's drawn them out there or it's like a, a really low tide. And, uh, and the, sometimes those bars are like really close, especially on the Gulf coast, those bars can kind of move in and actually move like all the way close to shore. Um, but so in most cases, those fish are the snook in particular are going to be right along the shoreline. And so when I fish them, I, I don't, I do not get in the water. I stand about like five, 10 feet up the beach, um, you know, away from the water and, and then cast, you know, cast at a diagonal, uh, up current. Of course, those fish are usually facing into the current. Um, so, so yeah, light lines and, and just make sure not to spook them. You know, they're, um, they're, they're very spooky fish. They're very wary. They're very smart. Uh, at least not, not so, not so much smart, but they, they are very good at, at sensing vibrations at, at sensing water movement, like approaching some, some snook in a boat, um, to sight fish is very difficult because those, you know, they can feel that boat, you know, the, the volume of the, that the water displaces from the boat. In many cases they can feel that and, and, and they might not swim away, but they're going to know some dangers around. They're going to be less likely to strike. Yeah. So I, I like wade fishing in particular. Um, I don't or, remember who said it, but it's like, if you can see the snook in particular, it can see you and it probably ain't going to bite. Yeah. Or if it can't see you, it can feel it. It can, you know, it can feel your presence. So that was, uh, that was actually a big advantage I had on that, uh, that balcony snook catch. <laughs> All that was, uh, you know, totally random, but uh, that snook, there's zero way that I could feel my presence. Um, so, so again, like a, a sight fishing from a boat is, is tough. Most of my sight fishing snook have come from beach fishing where, where I'm up the beach, there's no way they can feel my presence. They can possibly see me, but I think the, the feeling, you know, the feeling of water movement is what, uh, in my opinion, alerts them more than, than actual visual sight. 
Cool. But uh, but either way, they're they're uh, they're a spooky fish. But if you don't spook them, they're they're aggressive. So if you get them in a good mood, get a lure in front of their face when they're in a good mood, they're going to strike it. All right. Speaking of lures, if you only have one out on the beach, what are you going to use? Um. Yeah. I mean, it's a, a, a snook that is not spooked. It, it will hit pretty much. Uh, it'll hit a large variety of lures. So there's really not. I don't know. There's not one that totally outperforms the other. Um, if I only had one lure that like a soft plastics are always my favorite, but you know, once that soft plastic tail is ruined, um, you can only catch so many. So, um, if I had like an unlimited supply of, of soft plastic tails, I like, um, I like pro- for beach fishing, probably like those little gold pogies, um, which is that bait from that gold makes. That's a three inch. It's a little small profile bait, uh, has a little small, little paddle tail, and um usually, usually like white white seems to work good for beach fishing with a red jig head and um so if i had you know just one jig head and a bunch of tails that's that would be my go-to my go-to thing but you know if if i um if i had to pick one bait where i couldn't take extra tails with me i would take like a suspending plug maybe like a a mirror lure of some sort or um you know just a variety of different different plugs that will um suspend in the water where they're not not top surface they're not on the bottom. They'll kind of go down maybe like one to three feet. And, uh, and it'll just resemble, you know, the bait fish that they're seeing on, along the beaches. So, um, so in that instance, you don't have to worry about a uh, soft plastic tail ripping apart. You can, you can catch a lot of fish on, on just that one lure. Cool. Love it. And I, I assume you're using like a 3000 type reel. Yeah. I use 2500s in most cases. Um, cause with 10 pound line, you can still pack 150, 200 yards of line on them. And that's more than enough. Like snook, uh, snook are very strong. They're, they're very strong fish, but they're not going to rip off 200 yards or 150 yards of line for that matter. They'll have two to three really good runs. Um, but after that, they're, they're, they're kind of, they're kind of whipped. And um, the, the, lo- the, the um, longer line is really for, for like a tarpon, if tarpon come in the mix, but even still I've landed, you know, up to 50, 60 pound tarpon on 10 pound line with a 2,500 reel. So that's, you know, when you hit with the, that's the advantage of the braid is it's it's thinner it's stronger right uh, again uh, a 10 pound braid is is really you know really 20 pounds of, of strength in, in many cases depending on which line you get of course um and then when you can pack that onto a small reel you can get uh you know 200 or 150 plus yards of line on a on a 2500 reel and have the advantage of being super light where you can cast cast uh you know more easily on a long day and uh and uh, there's just no reason to go any bigger really save some money and and uh you still have plenty of line to to handle big fish cool all right so we talked a little bit about the docks and we just talked about the beaches let's talk about backcountry like catching snook on the flats in the summer um yeah i mean they're really snook are current oriented so summertime it's really about finding areas with a lot of current you know if, if you're on a a flat and it's in a, like a, a cove with no current at all. The, the odds of getting some, uh, you know, good quantities of good snook are slim. So, um, so yeah, I'd say summertime and, and CA obviously covers this in, in really, really good detail in, in this course, but you know, summertime, it's really about finding current. Um, and then, and then timing your trips, you know, timing your targeting of them during the periods where there's, there's max current, um, that's going to be by far the, the biggest advantage. And then, you know, on the, on the slower current tides or in the areas that have a little bit less current, then you can devote some time to like redfish and sea trout. Um, but, but again, for snook in particular during the summer, especially the heat of the summer, you know, that the current is, uh, is very, very important to, to maximize uh, when you're, when you're targeting the elusive snook. Yep. And I know CA, you know, he pointed out a lot of the snook, in the back country and, you know, some of those little deeper potholes, you know, not the ones that were like pure white sand, but a little bit darker tint to them, but you could still clearly know that it was a, a pothole. And I mean, dude, they were just sitting in there, big boys, just watching that bait go by and plucking them off. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Any pothole, uh, if, anytime on a flat, I will cast over any pothole, big or small. You just never know. But yeah, the, the bigger ones, you know, the bigger ones are, you can tell they're like a little bit more greenish hue to them. Um, than the, than just the, the flat, you know, the flat sand patches, but either way, that's a little bit, even if it's pretty flat, you know, that's still an ambush point, right. And that snooker ambush predator. So they'll still sit in that sand 
and and their their you know their top will basically be even with the grass. So a little shrimp or bait fish, or whatever, will go right along the top of the grass. And and by time it sees sees that snook, it's too late. Um, so yeah, any any pothole at all, um, definitely cast over it. It'll be snook, redfish, or trout. Or so flounder. what uh, what what lure do you like on the flats? Um, same with anything. I I, I prefer the salt plastic. So I usually you know, if it's shallow, if it's typically like one and a half, two feet, um, which is where I spend a lot of my time, um, some big fish are up there in the shallow waters. I, I just use those, uh, those weighted hooks, um, with like a three, a four to five inch, um, soft plastic, whether it's a gulp or Z man or DOA or zoom, you know, they're, they're all basically do the same thing, right? It's just a matter of if you rig it properly, it's going to have a really good action in the water and you're going to be able to cover that shallow span, um, without getting stuck in the grass, without getting weeds, you're going to be able to, to at least I personally feel like I can cover that, that type of water way more effectively than I can with any other, um, hard plastic bait that I've ever used. Um, just because, you know, it's hard plastic, you have treble hooks, even, you know, even after replacing treble hooks with single, like single inline hooks, which I like to do, um, you still snag weeds, you know, way, you know, way, way more than you do with soft plastic. So, you know, it's, um, all those baits work, right? It's, it's all about getting, uh, whatever lure you're using, get in, in front of fish and, and just, you know, retrieving it in a way that generates a strike. Um, so, so there's, there's a ton of lures that can do that. It's really about, I found that it's way better, it's way better to, to basically be a master at one or two lures, like just pick one and use it and force yourself to keep using it and just continually adjust the retrieve until you generate strikes. And then once you have that, you're going to be, you're going to be better off. Just keep using that lure. Yep, completely agree. Um, you said something earlier I want to bring up, and, it, and I've seen people do this on our boat, and we both learned the hard way as well, and that's when you have, you know, and this goes for any kind of soft plastic, but in particular when we're using these like owner twist lock hooks with, you know, a four or five inch soft plastic, and you rig it up, and a lot of guys just start making their cast, and they're like, I don't know why I didn't catch anything, and then I notice what they're doing is the opposite of what, we, what you and I do. Every single time we rig one up, the first thing we do is put it in the water. And if the trolling motor is going, we just kind of let it sit there or we move our hand to make sure that it's going completely straight. Because if it's helicoptering, that, that looks completely unnatural, to a, especially to a snook. But to a redfish or trout or anything, they're not going to hit it. So, I mean, it's so critical. Take a little, take those few extra seconds. I know, trust me, I know I'm the one that wants to get out there and start ripping it the second I have it on. But it's so critical. And I watch you do it every time you always dip your, uh, you know, dip the lure in, in the water and let it go for just a couple quick seconds to make sure it's going straight. And, and if it's not, then redo it. It's, it's not worth completely blowing out an area or spooking a fish with a crappy looking lure that's helicoptering and twisting all over the place. Yeah, that, that is 100% accurate. And yeah, soft plastics are, I, I believe are way more effective than any other lure as long as a rig properly, that was, that was the caveat I should have, uh, I should have had before, because if that bait is helicoptering, you know, if, if, if you're in, in, it's obviously check it, always check it before you make your first cast every time you re-rig a new bait. But, but then as you're fishing, right? Like as you're getting up close to the boat on every single cast, I look at the lure and make sure that it's, that it's, you know, when I am twitching it, it's doing a, you know, back and forth, kind of like a zero spook underwater. Right. It's like, it's like the, just the ultimate when it's swimming, right. I know I'm going to catch fish. I have zero doubt in my mind that if I can get the lure in front of a fish, it's going to eat it. Uh, but if it's helicoptering, it's, that's a whole different ball game. They're, they're not going to hit it. Cause that's just not, it's not a natural motion, right? Like nothing in the wild is sitting there doing like a quick <laughs> twirl like that. It's it, it, it totally, you know, may, maybe like, it's like Jack's will hit it. You know, lady fish just, just hit kind of anything that moves fast, but, but most of the, um, you know, the like redfish, snook and trout it, it's rare when they're not hooked properly. They're, they're just doing the helicopter and they're just, it's going to look unnatural and it's just going to trigger danger in their minds. Like something is totally wrong here. Whereas if it's darting, right. If it's darting like an injured shrimp or, uh, or a scared bait fish or sorry, a scared shrimp or an injured bait fish, which is what even like a five inch jerk bait. That's, that kind of looks like a bait fish. Um, when you're looking at it underwater, we have some good underwater footage for the, you know, uh, the inch slammer course, but it, it totally looks like a scared shrimp that's darting out of the grass. Uh, even though it's really designed to mimic a bait fish. So that's why I like these, these soft plastics is because when you're using them and doing, you know, doing the right retrieve, it can trigger a strike, whether they're, they're really honing on, on shrimp 
or if they're honing in on uh, on bait fish. So very very effective lure. But again, has like rigging it is like ninety percent of the of the uh, of of the of the results. You know, it's it's really based on on rigging it properly, and then you got to obviously do a good retrieve too. Yep, and then check it every time you get a strike. Obviously, if you catch a fish, certainly check it. But any kind of strike you get, I mean, anything that could set that hook or move the soft plastic off that hook at all, always, always check it. Yeah. And also, um, and also when, and so when you do that, right, if you are mindful of doing that, even say you have a, you know, a five inch jerk, jerk shad or zoom super fluke, whatever you're using and the tail gets bitten off, you know, I, I'm guilty of this as well, where I would see that and say, Oh my gosh, you know, it's stupid pinfish ruin my bait. I'm, I'm done. I, I gotta, I gotta get a new bait out. Right? I gotta throw this one away. That's keep using it keep using just make sure that the retrieve is still good right when you when you're reeling it in it's it's going at a straight line and if you're twitching it it goes you know kind of like a a zero spook because when you have that even i've actually got some of my biggest snook and redfish and trout on like a, a, what used to be a five inch you know, jerk shad or, or jerk bait and was whittled down to about three inches um from just getting you know tails bitten off from the little junk fish that they will still hit it and sometimes it's more effective it actually skips better so when I'm, when I'm, you know, uh, fishing mangroves, I'll, uh, I'll purposely either tear off the tail or just get an old one that has the tail already torn off because it has a truer skip. It'll skip way up under those trees. And, uh, so yeah, don't, um, don't be afraid to use a, a bait with a, with a tail bitten off. Cool. So let's talk about times, like best times, not necessarily of the year, assuming we're still talking about summer, maybe a little bit of late spring, uh, you know, CA was revealing in the course that, I mean, these snook are nocturnal. That's why a lot of people, you know, fish the, the, the lights on the docks at night. Uh, yeah. but then again, you can obviously catch them bright and early in the morning, sometimes a little bit tougher in the afternoon, but he gave some really cool tactics on catching them 24 hours a day. What, what's your favorite? Do you like the evening bite morning? Do you care? Well, the easiest is at night. All right. Then the, like the, you know, the, the easiest time as far as if I had an hour to fish or even like 30 minutes to fish and I wanted to catch a snook and I could do it any time of the day, I would do it at night. Uh, and I would pick a night time where the current is moving the fastest. Cause that's when, the, again, they, they like to be in round current. They feed by the current and at night they'll congregate by the lights just because it's a good, it's a great ambush time for them. Um, so yeah. So if, if, if I had a full 24 hours, uh, anytime I wanted just a 30, you know, 30 minute span, I would do the lights and be very confident that I was going to catch at least one, um, and ha- have some action. So at night with strong current, preferably outgoing, but incoming works too. Remember that's, that was, that was our game plan when we were fishing in little Gasparilla Island where we, we lived there for the month and we yeah. were on, I think it was like day 10 of catching an inshore slam for 10 days in a row. And that was only fishing uh, a couple hours a day. Cause we actually still had to work and get stuff done. And uh, that was like our thing. It was like, all right, if we can just catch at least one good trout and one good red, we knew that we could always catch a snook at the at the, at the lights at night. Yeah, and yeah. So yeah, during the day, yeah, we just, yeah, uh, trout and redfish. That's that, that was the goal. And yeah, then knowing that the snook, because because yeah, at night they 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 are they're just so predictable. As long as again, as long as a cold like a nasty cold front didn't just push through, they'll be at those. They'll typically be feeding pretty heavily at those lights at night. Yep. Yeah, it was a. Uh... I mean, those were some good times. Yeah, when you do that again. Yeah, we should. March Madness. We should. March Madness. We just missed it. We have to wait all the way till next March. Yeah. yeah. Jeez, brutal. So what else, man? Any uh, any final tips? We've got like, a couple minutes left. Any uh, final snook tips? Uh, not. I mean, not really. It's Again, it's just it's not about the perfect lure. It's not about the perfect tide, right? It's it's not the perfect moon phase. Just, just get out there. And no matter what, you know, what's going on, the, there's, there's some fish that are feeding even on the, even on the total nasty days where like some days I'd never even considered fishing actually are pretty good. Like I caught a good slam the other day when the tides were actually, the current wasn't moving, the wind was ripping. It was like during a cold front and still, you know, the fish are still biting. So when you just get out there, spend time in the water, like take note of everything, um, where the bait fish are, right? How the water, like where the fish are positioning. You know, if you're dock fishing, where are the position are they on the shallow side, on the deep side? Um, you know, take note of the depth where are your strikes are occurring. Take note of the depths where your strikes are not occurring, and uh, and just 
just always be aware. And, and for shortcuts and all this, you know, highly, highly recommend just checking out the that insider, uh, the insider club that we have because we 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 take note of all those details and we share it with all the club members so that you can stay on, you know, up on the latest trends. Um, and just make sure that you're maximizing your time in the feeding zones and, and minimizing your time in those dead zones. Yep. Cause it's really hard to do if you're only fishing, you know, once a week or a couple of times a month, it, it's really, really hard to do that um, without some, some extra help. And that's why the fishing guides catch more fish cause they're out there every day. But if you just have, you know, a little bit of guidance and just know the, the general tips on, on what's, you know, what's happening, you're going to have a huge advantage. Yeah. And I know over on the East coast, one little final tip, this is uh, from our boy, Tony, who, uh, who doesn't always target snook. He catches a lot of them as a bycatch to redfish and trout, but right before and right after a big storm comes through, he kills it on the snook, but you'll have to join the salt strong insider club to find out why <laughs> and exactly how to catch them during those times and where, but that's it for this episode. All about snook fishing in the summer. Please go to saltstrong.com forward slash podcast to see all of the past episodes and to see how you can join this insider fishing club completely risk free. If you have any questions, let us know in the comment area. We'd love to hear from you. That's it. Until next week. Pow! Tight lines. Booyah. <laughs>